I just realized you didn't hear anything I said. Uh, I didn't even hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I just hit the record button. So if it's time to start, anybody misses anything, uh, we can just uh, go from there. Good, good, good. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. All right. Uh, so welcome to your shark ecology class. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm going to be your instructor, leader, talkier off person for the next hour or so. I'm very, very happy to be here uh, and I'm excited to get going. Um, just a show of hands, those of you who were sent the online learning, how many of you finished it completely? Just out of curiosity. One, two, couple people. Um, like, like it said in the email, it wasn't a mandatory thing to finish. Um, we're going to be going basically through each section, just talking a little bit about it. Uh, I have made a little PowerPoint to kind of guide us through. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys, uh, and we'll get going on that PowerPoint. Let me pull it up real quick. Uh, I had sent, I replied to the email to follow the instructions, but I actually never got the link to the e-learning material. Okay, so it should have been sent through your MySSI. Um, if you look on your app, if it doesn't show up, I might have to send it to you again. I believe I sent it out to everyone, but I'll have to check that for you. I'll go look Piper up for you right now and do that while you continue course. So I'll go, I'll go make sure she's got it. Okay. Okay. Just while you're doing that. This is the first time I've ever done this. So clicking around. You're not waiting on anything for me, are you, Anna? No, I just have to open my settings and allow Zoom to share my screen. It's loading. Oh, got it. Sorry. No, it's fine. I just... All right. Didn't realize that I had to do it. All right. Here we go. Can we see this? Anybody? Yes. Can you see my screen or you still see everybody's faces? Yes. Okay, good. I can see it now. It's loading. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. So just like everything, we're going to start from the very beginning, once it loads and decides to start. Here we go. All right, so welcome to shark ecology. 
Uh, like I mentioned earlier, my name is Anna. I'm going to be your instructor slash guide today. Uh, and I'm here representing Honolulu Scuba Company and Island Divers Hawaii. So if you guys ever find yourselves out here, come and visit us. Um, so a couple things I want to talk about before we get into the whole um, shark presentation. Um, first thing I want to talk about is how this course is going to work, okay? Uh, this is a relatively informal course, um, so it's open for discussions. If at any point I'm talking and you have a question, um, or if you have some side information or something cool to add to the conversation, go ahead and unmute yourself and let me know, okay? Uh, as an instructor, I learn about as much from my students as you guys learn from me, okay? Um, so if you know something I don't know, let me know, okay? Um, maybe further down the road, I might use it in one of my classes or, you know, it might be a fun tidbit that comes up in conversation, okay? Um, something uh, that I also wanna talk to you guys about uh, is using Zoom, okay? Um, so as of right now, you guys are all muted. So I think you guys uh, have that down, the muting and the unmuting. Um, just make sure that whenever you do have something to say, whether it's a question, comment, concern, whatever it is, make sure to remember to unmute yourself um, just so that you're not sitting there, lips moving and nothing coming out. A um, couple other things, we do have a message board, okay? Uh, so on your screen, uh, you can click over to the message board um, and if you, you know, want to write something in there or something like that, uh, I'd recommend that um, you unmute yourself and ask your question instead of just writing in the message board, uh, just because it's a easier way to get my attention faster. Um, and then also there's a little button that says reactions uh, that you guys can give a thumbs up or, you know, if you want to do it the old fashioned way, you can just give me a thumbs up or an okay or, you know, whatever hand signal you want to give me. Uh, but those are just sort of some basic things. Uh, with using the Zoom. The biggest thing is going to be remembering to unmute yourself if you have something to say. Okay. Um, the next thing that I want to talk to you guys about really quickly is just the SSI app. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about it. Um, I really just want to mention that when you're using the SSI app and you're taking all these ecology classes or, you know, you're working towards your master diver or something like that, um, it's really, really cool that all of your certifications are processed and all your cards are stored on your MySSI app. Uh, you know, we all go on those dive trips and you show up and you don't have your certification card and then you got to wait in line for somebody to look up your credentials and find your certification number and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really good with SSI that you can just pull it up yourself, walk to the shop and give it to them. You know, people leave their cards at home all the time, but how many times do you leave the house without your phone, right? Never, okay? Um, so that's something really cool about the SSI app. Um, if towards the end we have some time and you wanna stick around and ask me some more questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but just for the sake of right now, I don't wanna go into too much detail about it. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is um, important whenever it comes to doing anything as far as SSI training, okay? Um, they go by uh, what's this really cool concept of the SSI Diver Diamond, okay? Um, it, it's really their philosophy on how to create a full and well-rounded diver, okay? Um, and that comes with doing it in four parts, okay? So the first part is what we're doing today, is your knowledge section, okay? That's what we're doing today. We're doing our online learning. We're doing our classroom stuff. That's our knowledge portion, okay? That's one of the important things of making a good diver. Uh, of course, skills is important. Everybody, we, we know that skills are important when it comes to being a diver. We make you do a buttload of them when you become an open water diver, right? We wanna make sure that you are proficiently skilled to let you off into the big blue, right? Uh, the next thing is experience, okay? Um, you can learn all the skills in the world, but if you don't have experience, you know, you're not just gonna hop into the water and, and swim on off. Uh, it's really important that as the next part of, um, you know, your training, you get as much experience because with the more experience, the better you get. Um, and I'm still getting my experience. I'm still learning every day. Uh, it's something that, that you never really stop doing, 
Um, and then uh, equipment. Equipment was something that they mentioned in the online learning. They sort of show you the, the total diving system and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't really pertain necessarily to this course, but they put it in all of them just because it, it's good information to know. Um, you know, basic dive equipment, how it works, what it's used for, uh, and also the promotion of getting your own gear. Okay, that's really important, especially in this day and age uh, where there's all different kinds, all different kinds of manufacturers. You want to make sure you have your own because you know how it works, you know when it's been used, and, and um, it's a really big asset. So um, this is a really great philosophy that I really do admire whenever it comes to any kind of teaching. Um, because you could have a student that's really good at knowledge, uh, but doesn't really pay attention to, you know, their skills or their experience. And that doesn't make them a well-rounded diver. That just makes them smart. Um, so it, it's really cool that they highlight these four qualities in a well-rounded diver. So I, I find that very fascinating. And I really, really appreciate that about them. Um, and the last thing I want to talk to you guys about are your SSI diving levels. Okay. Um, so I do have um, a chart here. It's probably not the best picture, but it does sort of map out um, sort of the levels of diving. Um, with SSI, it's really cool. They don't just go, um, you know, here, pay this amount of money, we'll give you the materials, you do some dives, and then you're certified at the next level. Um, they sort of give you smaller goals to attain, and it makes it a little bit more re rewarding than just paying some money, um, and then doing some dives. Um, so with the specialties that you guys are racking up with your shark ecology or turtle ecology or whatever else classes you guys are taking, um, you guys are racking up these specialties here. Uh, and then all you guys need to do are some dives and you could move up from level two to three. Um, and then once you get to level four, you have your 50 dives, four specialties, and then all you got to do is a stress and rescue and you're a master diver. Uh, and something that SSI is doing uh, for this year, uh, for all the students that reach their master diver level in 2020 are entered to win um, a two person live aboard trip. Uh, I don't remember exactly where it was, um, but I know that every, um, student that's certified as a master diver in 2020 is entered um, to win uh, the live aboard trip, which I think is super cool. I wish I could go back and do my master diver this year, but we're, we're past the point of no return on that one. So um, I'm leaving it up to you guys, one of you guys to win this. Uh, I think that'd be really cool. Um, so yeah, that's basic information uh, about sort of their, their diving levels, which I really appreciate also. Um, so that's sort of our uh, pre-class stuff. Um, so now let's get into talking about sharks, what we really came here to talk about, all right? Um, so I've got this really cool little video to show you guys. Uh, there's a couple little Easter eggs in there for those of you who finished the online learning. You might recognize some review questions in here, um, which is really cool. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get it started. If for any reason you guys can't hear the audio or if it's not loud enough, uh, just unmute yourself and let me know and I'll get that taken care of, but here we go. Yeah, I can barely hear it. Is that better? can't really hear it and I've got my computer up max too. Yeah, it's, it's not really audible. Yeah, okay. I can hear it at all. Well, I've got the link. I can just pull up the actual YouTube video. I think that one might be one of the lower ones in terms of volume.
So Anna, you're you're still sharing the presentation. If you've brought up your browser, you may have to change your screen share because we're still looking at the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm just opening the web page. So let me share now this screen with you. We'll see if this audio is better. You gotta get through the camel commercial. Can you guys hear that better though? on any review questions anybody find anything familiar in there the cartilage skeleton mm -hmm. yeah so one of the, one of the first review questions is about uh the largest shark species ever would have been the megalodon not the whale shark. Uh, they talked a little bit about the mermaid purses. That was one of the review questions. Uh, so that's a good video to go back to. Uh, for example, Piper uh, or anybody else that didn't finish the online learning. That's a good video to kind of go back through um, while you're doing the online learning or again before you start it. Um, so that's a pretty good um, useful tool for that. All right, so let's go back to my PowerPoint. Yes, I know, we already tried. All right, um, so part of your um, online learning, it talked a little bit about classifying sharks, uh, but the diagram and the picture didn't have a lot of information about it. Uh, it just sort of had a, um, you know, a couple pictures of sharks and, and their names. It didn't really break them up on very much on how they're classified. Um, it does mention um, that there are eight orders and about 512 species. Um, but I just wanted to kind of showcase how they're broken up into those eight particular orders. Um, almost all of it is physical characteristics. Um, so starting with the anal fin, do they have it or do they not? Um, that's a rather broad um, sort of feature that either they do or don't have. So that's a good place to start. Um, and then breaking it off from there. So if they did have it, um, the amount of dorsal fins or gills they have. Okay, so splitting it up from there. Um, and then even smaller from there, fin spines or no fin spines. So it's all physical characteristics that breaks them up into their eight orders. Um, and then mouth placement in front of the eyes or behind the eyes. Um, and then I had heard about the nictating membrane or eyelids before uh, in sharks, but I actually looked up that there are a couple different species of reptiles and amphibians and also cats have them too. Uh, I didn't know that about cats. Um, but you can see sometimes uh, in videos, you'll see that the shark, instead of blinking, most of them don't blink because they don't have the upper and bottom um, eyelids. They just have the, the nictating membrane or the eyelids that go horizontally instead of closing uh, vertically, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring this photo up because it, it described a little bit better than just pictures and names of the sharks underneath them. Yeah, that's great. We can look at a whale shark and see that it's a whale shark, but it, it's fun to kind of look at where they fall in the orders of these 512 species. So I thought that was really cool to take a look at. Um, so the next section was talking a little bit about, um, you know, sharks role in the ecosystem. Um, and it talked a little bit about a cascading effect um, so talking about removing sharks or large numbers of sharks in 
your a particular ecosystem um, can change the way that the ecosystem runs based on you know smaller fish um, preying on different kinds and and you know being able to uh, not be able to control the population uh, but there's another study that I found from University of Miami um, that talks about how the removal of sharks impacts directly um, different physical features and attributes in different kinds of fish, which I thought was really cool. Um, and again, whenever I play this video, if you guys can't hear it, I can pull up the um, actual link online. Can't hear it. Okay. So for some reason, the, the audio is loud on mine, but I guess it's not loud enough for you guys. So let's, I'll just bring up the actual link for you guys. Is there a captions feature? Um, so these are all screen recordings from my computer. Um, so I don't have captions for them. Uh, when I recorded them on my computer, the, um, the audio was very loud and I made sure to make it loud so that whenever this would play, you guys would be able to hear it. But I guess that seemingly genius idea backfired on me. <laughs> So while that's loading, I just want to take you guys through sort of the online learning. Um, so section one sort of talks about um, the relationship between sharks and humans. Uh, I've got a little tidbit in there a little bit later talking a little bit about that. Um, and then the sharks across time, this is where they talk about the classifying of the sharks. And I just want to pull up this particular page uh, in here for you guys to look at. So they had this picture in there and I didn't find that sufficient enough. And so I found that other classification picture online, which I liked much more um, because these are just kind of cartoon drawings versus actual photos. Um, so I found that much more useful. So let's see, this is loading here. Let's see if you guys can hear this. Predators can have large effects on their prey populations. Some are obvious, like killing and consuming their prey, which regulates prey population sizes. However, some predator effects on prey are not as obvious. Predators can also affect the behavior and even physical traits of their prey. For example, predators can elicit changes in the body shape of their prey, which makes them less appetizing or allows them to better escape their predators. This is important because populations of many apex predators are in major decline. Across the globe, many shark populations are declining, and so there's this big impetus to try to figure out what the effects are on the ecosystem. To address this issue, a group of researchers conducted a study in Western Australia to examine how the removal of sharks from coral reefs affected the morphology of different prey fish species. A series of reefs off northwestern Australia provide a really unique opportunity to test what the effects of shark removals are on the fish communities. One of the systems, the Rowley Shoals, are protected from fishing and have healthy shark populations. In contrast, the Scots reefs are subjected to shark fishing, making them pretty depleted in shark populations. Seven fish species were collected at both reefs. 
scientists photographed and measured aspects such as tail fins and eyes for each fish. They found that in coral reefs in which humans had wiped out sharks, the prey fishes generally had smaller tail fins and smaller eyes in comparison to sites with healthy shark populations. Their tail is primarily where they get their propulsion from. It's going to help them quickly evade a predator. And larger eyes enable them to detect predators probably from a larger distance away. Having large eyes and having large fins come at a cost energetically. You know, you need to have more brain power to have larger eyes. So it's possible that where you don't have predators, you don't have to waste all your energy and growth on maintaining big eyes where you can focus on something else like reproduction or feeding. And what it really shows is that having large eyes and large tails are probably costly, and therefore, you know, those have become reduced in places where they're not necessary anymore. These data suggest that the loss of predatory sharks from human causes can drive changes in prey fish body shapes. Humans can indirectly impact species that they don't even interact with. In this case, humans are removing sharks, and therefore they're having an indirect impact on variety of different fishes at different levels in the food web. So how cool is that, right? So, I mean, it's cool that we can do certain things. I mean, sharks can indirectly impact something like a completely different body shape to a fish. Um, so. It, that's pretty fascinating to me that it not only is a population control issue, it's also the, the changing of physical attributes and features uh, in fish populations. Um, so I, find, I found that really fascinating. And so you, your um, online learning just talks about population control and how that is changed by the cascading effect. Um, but I thought that was cool about talking um, specifically about different features that are changed in sizes and things like that. I thought that was really cool. Um, so the next section, um, you guys may have seen in a small little uh, section in the very beginning uh, where they were talking about sharks uh, in Hawaii. Um, so they did mention Deep Blue as one of if not the largest uh, great white recorded to this day as, as of right now that's living. Um, she actually came here to the island last year. Um, and that's this picture right here with the, the two free divers, one with the camera. Uh, that was while she was here. Uh, and just to give you a little size perspective. Um, We're still seeing the SSI page. Oh. I gotta share the PowerPoint again. Thanks guys, thanks for speaking up and telling me that I'm yapping on about something. Um, so this picture right here, so we've got just a little bit of a, a, a spatial reference. So we've got two average size free divers and they look a lot taller because they've got these large fins on them. Um, but here's another little chart. So the average human, six feet tall. So we've got uh, the average length of great whites average uh, so the male 11 to 13 feet that's still pretty big females 15 to 16 that's really big and then you've got deep blue estimated 22 feet that's ginormous um and i was not here to see that uh, but i do know that matt was here uh when she came by um, and they took a boat out and got to see this giant whale carcass that she was feeding on. Um, and I actually have um, a little bit of a video from when she came. Um, I might have to um, load this one. Actually, this one doesn't have any audio, so just read and enjoy. So this is when she came to Oahu and was feasting on a giant whale carcass. How 
How cool is that? 2,400 miles away. That just shows you how migratory these sharks are. And that's not even the furthest distance that's ever been recorded. How cool is that, right? I can't imagine being able to be here and see you even just what was left behind. Do you want me to take over the screen share for a second? I can show you guys. Uh, when that was here, we, uh, we had a group of free divers that uh, came out on the boat and they hired me to go out to that. So if you want me to uh, take over that screen share for a second, I can. I can show you those pictures from that day. Yes, because please. I would love to see them. You guys might want to see that. All right. So I'll take over the screen share. And here we go. You guys seeing my screen? Yes. All right. So this is, I, I didn't take, I didn't get in the water, but those, those guys that were, um, uh, there, they were there this day. That they, they made that National Geographic video, but um, so the video they were there. Uh, we're actually in one of their shots because we were on the Enzo. I don't know if you guys recognize this yellow. That's our boat, the Enzo. But it was super flat out that day, and that's that shark swimming around. Um, it was pretty neat. You took that from the helm. Yeah, I I, I took that from the helm. Um, uh, that's another shot. Let me go here. I just got so I can slide these through. I mean, it's hard to put 22 feet in perspective in photos, but this, this is the guy that actually organized the trip. He's like, I've got a bunch of free divers, we want to go out there. And he was in the water about three or four minutes earlier than this. And he was like, that's a really big shark. And he got out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, he was, it was like so big. He, they got scared, right? But everybody was just so stoked because there was just this massive shark swimming around underneath the, underneath the boat. And uh, everybody was just having a great time taking, taking pictures. And, um, I mean, that's one of those once in a lifetime type things. Yeah, it's not something you, you see very often, right? It was pretty, it was a pretty amazing experience. And this was pretty far offshore. We were like seven or eight miles offshore. Oh, that picture's really good. This is one of our captains, Megan, right there. She was out there as the crew that day. That's her. She was pretty happy. Okay, and so that is the actual uh, carcass of the whale. And that's Oahu in the background. That's how far offshore we were. We were pretty far offshore. And this little boat, not, not this one, this little boat over here was the boat of the guys who made that National Geographic special. That tiny little boat, that's it? Yeah, it was, the weather was really nice. So when we were going out here, it was like, you know, normally like this far offshore, the waves are like really big and stuff. But it was really, really, really flat. So it was pretty good timing for doing this. It was pretty neat. Uh, yeah, that, oh man. So the only thing about this freaking whale carcass, there wasn't very much um, uh, wind out there. But when you got downwind of this thing, it was seriously nasty. It was pretty bad. So, but that, that's actually one of the fins of, of one of the, sh one of the sharks. There was some, there was two tiger sharks at this carcass, um, before the, uh, great white showed up when the great white showed up, the tiger card, the tiger sharks, uh, pounded sand, man, they were out of there. They were oh like, yeah. It's, it's once the big guy shows up, all the little babies bugger off. The little guys were gone. So, but it was really, it was really nice day out there, and that's Honolulu in the background. We were pretty far, um, pretty far offshore. So, cool. Well, that's that's, awesome. uh, that was a side note, but that was that, 
we we were we were pretty lucky. We were there that day. We got to go out, and uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting. History. I wish I was here for that. I'm so jealous. As soon as you told me that, after I I came in and and you know found some research about it, you're like, yeah, I was there. <laughs> I was so mad. All right. So moving back to let's take a look at the e-learning. You guys can see it. Yes. I'm going to assume yes, nobody's answering. Um, so part of the next section, so section three, um, it goes into a little bit into depth about the anatomy, uh, but it doesn't really show you anything about the internal anatomy, um, which is pretty important. I mean, it's just as important as the external anatomy. Um, and one piece that's um, really important with that um, is the, let me get it up for you, um, is the liver, okay? Um, so anybody remember how much space of the internal shark the liver takes up on average? Anybody remember that number percentage? Nobody? It's 95%, all right? So you can see that it's, it's noted under here, this whole red blob here, minus this tiny little stomach right here. Oh, sorry, let's go back. This whole liver is responsible for the buoyancy of this shark. That's why it's so big, that's why it's so important. So I thought that was important to note uh, that we had an actual picture of it to show you guys, uh, you know, in terms of everything else. Um, and then, so going back over the fins, okay, so we have the dorsal fin here that's labeled. Uh, the caudal fin, often mis mistaken for the tail fin, uh, scientific term, we're smart people, we call it a caudal fin. Um, anybody remember what this little guy is back here? Anal fin? That's going to be on the bottom here. Ah, Good guess. It says in the same spot, but it's on top instead of the bottom. Anybody? Nobody remembers? What about this one down here on the bottom? Nobody remembers that one either? Well, we know this one's the anal fin down here, right below this one, which is the second dorsal fin or secondary. So we've got the anal fin down here, this is the pectoral fin. So they have two of them on the side. It's sort of around their chest area. And that's how I remember it's the pectoral. And then here down at the bottom. So we've got the anal fin here. Who remembers what this one is? Is that the clasper? No. So this is, this is a fin right here. The clasper would be in between. The, this fin, I almost said it and the anal fin here. It would be in between the two. Is that the uh, ventral? It's the pelvic fin. So you've got the, the pectorals and the pelvic, the two Ps. I used to get those confused all the time. So the pectoral ones are up where the chest is, and then the pelvic is you know, where their pelvis is. It's a good way to uh, remember it. Uh, another thing that they talk about with the anatomy uh, are the little sensors they have up here, the ampullae of Lorenzini. Um, a really cool thing, uh, you guys may have seen it um, or heard about it, it's called tonic immobility. Uh, this is used in both sharks and rays. 
um, it's, it's really interesting. It's a way to stimulize them to where they're so relaxed that they almost can't move. Um, so for sharks, it's the ability to stimulize these uh, ampullae of Lorenzini, these sensors in the front of them, to the point where they're so relaxed they're almost paralyzed. Um, for, um, for rays, you kind of fold their, their uh, fins in, make a little taco, and you flip them upside down. Uh, and it just sort of immobilized them. So I have a little video of that, which I think is really cool. Uh, that doesn't need audio either. It's really quick. So you see he's kind of like uh, a man in a circus balancing it on his hand where all those little sensors are in the front and he's stimulizing them to the point where, you know, the shark is basically paralyzed, um, which is absolutely fascinating to me, um, how sensitive their sensors are up there. Um, so I thought that was a really cool thing that they didn't talk about in the learning that, you know, I've, I'd heard about before from watching Shark Week a hundred times um, that I thought was something really cool to share with you guys. Um, so that was sort of the section about sort of anatomy. Um, they talk about dermal denticles and all of that kind of stuff, but it was mentioned in the uh, video earlier. Uh, the next section of the online learning, um, if we flip through, uh, talks about reproduction. So the process of making more sharks. Um, there was some good information about here. Um, there were some large words that were kind of hard to pronounce uh, and didn't necessarily make sense to me when I first read them. Uh, but I found this cool video online. Um, explaining um, some of these words, what they mean, and also helping with the pronunciation, which I, I find very helpful, especially uh, with science things. Um, I, I like um, knowing how to properly pronounce things so that if I ever need to, um, you know, use it in a conversation or, you know, say it, I'm pronouncing it properly. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and load this one onto my computer, um, just in case it's not loud enough. I don't want to start it and then have to restart it for you guys. Are they born from eggs or live born or both? How do sharks reproduce? I'm Jonathan Berg. And All right. So let me screen share so you guys can see that. And this is Shark Academy. So the video is kind of childish, but... It has some good information. Unlike fish, which produce large amounts of eggs, most of which never reach maturity, sharks produce far fewer but larger offspring, and they have a much better chance of reaching adulthood. Sharks can reproduce in several ways. Many small sharks, like the horn shark, the swell shark, and cat sharks, actually lay eggs on the bottom. The baby shark develops in there, living on a yolk sac filled with nutrients. The baby, a miniature version of its parents, is born after a few months to a year of gestation, depending on the water temperature and the species. Sharks using this reproductive strategy are called oviparous, meaning egg-laying. Other sharks are viviparous. They give birth to live young, which develop inside the mother shark, receiving nutrients and oxygen from mom through an umbilical cord, just like humans. Larger sharks like blue sharks, bull sharks, and hammerheads use this technique. The last group of sharks are ovoviviparous, also known as aplacental yolk sac viviparous. In this system, the mother produces eggs like the oviparous system, but instead of laying her eggs on the bottom, she carries them inside her body until they hatch. When the babies pop out, you might think the shark was viviparous, but the babies had no umbilical cord inside. They lived off a yolk sac. In the weird category, the sand tiger shark has a strange variation on its ovoviviparous reproduction known as intrauterine cannibalism. The mother produces up to 50 pups in each of two uteruses, but the first baby in each uterus that reaches about four inches long eats all of its siblings. After 12 months of gestation, the mother then gives birth to a pair of three-foot-long pups, pups that are well-fed. 
Because sharks put so much more time, effort, and energy into producing a viable offspring than bony fish do, they give birth to far fewer pups. A whale shark produces the most pups of any shark, around 300 at a time. But then again, mom is the size of a bus. The thresher and sand tiger only produce two pups at a time. The blue shark can produce 135 at a time, which is a lot for a shark not the size of a bus. Gestation is long too, averaging 9 to 12 months. Baby spiny dogfish take 22 months, almost two years, for their young to develop. Most sharks take quite a while to become mature enough to reproduce as well. Great hammerheads take 9 years. Lemon and bull sharks take 15 years. Spiny dogfish, 20 years. So how about that? Interuterine cannibalism. I never heard of that before in my life. And I thought that that was incredibly fascinating. And uh, if I had read the word ovoviviparous on a sheet of paper, I would never have known how to properly pronounce it. Um, so that was a pretty good summarization of um, sort of the reproduction of sharks. It, it was kind of a kitty video you know they had the little crying baby in there and some kind of goofy sounds in there uh, but it was some good information so i thought that was good to share with you guys um so back here um yes uh next section sort of talked about um the protection um of sharks in the environment um so i thought it would be a good idea to bring up um, this idea of shark sanctuaries. Um, so they've been sort of in motion in the past 50 years. Um, they're little pieces of, of land and sea, mostly islands, um, that have decided to uh, name themselves uh, shark sanctuaries to make it illegal um, to fish for um, or capture or um, harm sharks in any way. Um, I thought that was a really cool thing. Um, I have been to uh, a couple of them in the Bahamas, and people take it very seriously with sharks. Um, and I, I, I think that's awesome that more and more places throughout the years uh, are deciding to, to join that um, and sort of stand up uh, to the world and say, hey, we need these guys um, for all these reasons in the environment and, and how it, it helps maintain a healthy ecosystem. So I think that's a really cool movement uh, that people are standing up and speaking up for sharks. Um, so there's a list um, of all these places and they're sort of labeled here uh, on the map. Um, and it, it tells you when they were established. So it tells you, you know, who came first, um, you know, sort of paved the way for everybody else. And, and you know, more and more are joining um, every year, which I think is, is really cool um, that people are starting to take notice that sharks aren't scary you know, they're cool and we need to take care of them, right? Um, so I thought that was really, really cool uh, that I found a, a decent map uh, about that. Um, let's go back to the e-learning here. because I wanna show you guys something in here. So going back to that, um, so making more sharks reproduction. Um, so the senses of sharks, that was pretty um, well talked about in, in the online learning. There wasn't a whole much, bunch more to go into detail about. Uh, and I didn't really find any really good pictures describing how sharks smell. Uh, it wasn't really something that was uh, easy to draw a picture of. Um, and then of course, sharks in the ecosystem talking about these sanctuaries and how important that they are um, to the survival of sharks because of how many we've lost um, since, you know, the creation of the movie Jaws when that fear sort of set in for people and started going after sharks. Uh, these sanctuaries are so important for preserving the future of um, shark populations. Um, so I thought that was really, really cool. Um, and then the bizarre, the awesome, and the beautiful. Um, so 
couple interesting species that they talk about in there. I don't, I don't want to ruin it for those of you who haven't gotten to this section, because uh, I think that's something really cool um, that you guys are, will kind of touch on whenever you do this section. Uh, but I did find another uh, bizarre, awesome, and beautiful thing about sharks uh, that wasn't in there, um, and that is bioluminescent sharks. Um, so I have a little video on that. I might have to load it again because of the audio. Um, so let me go ahead and load that on there just for the sake of having to not have audio. So I, I knew that there were, you know, bioluminescent bacteria and there were some coral um, that did. I had no idea that, you know, sharks and, and other animals, because coral are animals, uh, had the potential of becoming bioluminescent. Um, I didn't learn that until quite recently. So I found it really fascinating and I found a really cool video um, about that. Let me pull that up for you guys. Let me pause it so it doesn't start. There we go. So let me share that with you guys. All right. So glowing sharks, let's take a look at them. This amazing thing happened a few years ago. We accidentally found a fluorescent fish, and then that led us to over 200 fluorescent fish, including two species of sharks. I wanted to film these sharks in their natural world with the shark eye camera and see essentially what their world looks like through their eye. So humans see in three colors, red, green, and blue. And as soon as we go underwater, we start losing all the other colors quickly and it becomes dark and blue. These biofluorescent sharks that we're looking at are called swell sharks. These sharks had only one visual pigment and it was only right at the intersection of blue and green. They're in a blue world where everything is blue, but they're capable of turning blue into green. Once we learned what the pigment of the shark eye was like, we filtered a very sensitive camera we had, a red epic, to have the same color sensitivity as the shark. At 120 feet in this canyon, we were just using the blue ocean light. And this was difficult for us humans, but the sharks can still see amazingly well. And that makes sense because they've been down there for 400 million years and they've been living in an environment with very little light. This was a huge step for us because we didn't even know could the swell sharks, could the fluorescent sharks see this? And with the study, now we know, yes, because they can see the fluorescence among themselves. This almost seems like when it was discovered that bats were communicating with sound outside of human detection and that there was a whole mode of communication going on. And with sharks, it could be something similar. How they're using it, now we can even go further and further. We're in this era where we're losing species at a rate that we haven't seen in millions of years. So in trying to connect with nature, it's important to kind of empathize with nature and even see what these animals are seeing. And by putting ourselves behind the shark's eye, gives us a portal into their life. Pretty cool, huh? Um, so, I found that incredibly fascinating that not only could we see the biofluorescence of these sharks, that they also could see it in each other. 
uh, and that developed as an adaptation from being in you know a dark bottom of the ocean for so long is is that they're able to see incredible things in each other that we as humans uh, don't normally see um, and it's another reason why it's so important to be preserving uh, these species, especially ones that we don't know a whole lot about, um, that we can continue to study and learn more and learn things from them um, instead of just trying to get rid of them. Um, so that was really, really cool that, that they were able to take the shark eye camera and be able to see what these sharks are seeing, not only what we as humans see. Um, so really, really cool stuff. Um, Let's hop back to this. So that was our glowing sharks, which I thought was really cool. Uh, another thing I talked about earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, reproduction and ovoviviparous, uh, how that is a difficult word to say. Um, Matt actually found uh, this really cool website that he sent me a link to. Uh, it's called Emma Saying. Um, they have a page on YouTube where they have all these little YouTube videos that help with pronunciation. So like genus and species and, and all that kind of long scientific words that are um, not so easy to read and even harder to pronounce. Uh, they have these little videos right here. Um, so I want to go ahead and play this. This is the genus and species of a great white shark. Can you guys hear that? Carcarius. Carcaridon. Were you guys able to hear that? A little yeah. bit, yeah. Yeah, no so Carcarius, Carcaridon. It's, it's more than a difficult scientific word. It's almost a tongue twister. I had to practice for a little while before I realized I was going to have to say that out loud. Carcaris, car I can only say it once, um, but that's a really cool website. Um, so for those of you in school um, or those of you who just love reading and science, uh, if you come across a word that you're not familiar with, go ahead and look it up on there and they'll give you the proper pronunciation. Um, so you sound very educated and smart whenever you use it in conversation. Um, it's a really, really cool tool and it can be used for all kinds of things, not necessarily um, scientific terms. Uh, it can be used for anything. Uh, they have all different kinds of words. I think they have a couple um, in different languages, but not all of them. They might have a couple in Spanish and maybe Italian and French. Uh, I don't know anything beyond that. I was just looking up Spanish because I'm, I'm trying to learn right now. Uh, but that's also... Um, a good tool that I'm using with uh, learning another language, helping with pronunciation. Uh, so I thought that was really cool and something that I, I really wanted to share with you guys. Um, that's something that you could use in the future. Um, and then um, after that, I do have um, a couple things that I didn't get to use um, in this presentation that I kind of want to share with you guys. Um, so I have some videos and I'd be more than happy uh, to send you these links in an email or something like that. They were just a little long, uh, but they have some really good information if you want to kind of go above and beyond and, and if you love sharks and you want to um, watch these videos. There's a whole BBC shark series uh, that I found online. Um, and there's a couple different episodes. I didn't get through all of them. I, I would just watch the first two. Um, but it was really, really cool. Um, it was kind of like a mini shark week. You know how shark week can be kind of long and they talk a lot about shark attacks and it can be kind of scary. This BBC series is all information based uh, and, and it's, it's very positive towards sharks, which I, I believe as humans we need to be nowadays. Um, so like I said, if you guys want or are interested in any of these, I'd be happy to send you the links. Um, these next two videos right here uh, one is just um, a, just one video itself. Um, oh, Piper. Fun fact, humans are also bioluminescent. Yeah, our eyes are lame, so we just can't see it. <laughs> but that'd be interesting. Who else can see it if, if we can't? 
That's cool. I did not know that. Thank you, Piper. That's awesome. Um, so, um, another thing that they talk about in the very beginning of the online learning um, is the history of sharks in Hawaiian culture. Um, it's really, really cool concept. Um, it's it's sort of like um, they use the idea or uh, use natural animals and nature um, as reincarnations of family members once they've passed. And sharks are a big, big um, uh, part of that. Um, just talking about how they've got all kinds of stories and and you know actual local Hawaiian people who still live by that um, culture of reincarnation of family members and nature specifically sharks and how sharks are praised in Hawaiian culture uh, and how important they are so um, there is um, an entire series there's like seven episodes uh, the deep end there's seven ep episodes of it uh, but this video, The Shark Gods of Hawaii, um, there was a little piece of the video that I was going to show you guys, but it was only like 10 seconds and you didn't get the full effect. Um, so that video is also a really good one if you want to learn a little bit more about sharks in Hawaiian culture in particular. Um, and then also, um, I found these videos describing the internal anatomy um, of sharks, not just the liver. Uh, cause I know they, they only really talk about the liver in, in the e-learning and they talk about the external anatomy, the dermal denticles, like ampullae of Lorenzini and all the fins and stuff like that. Uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more about, uh, the internal anatomy of sharks, these two YouTube videos go through them, uh, pretty well. One of them's like a half an hour long. Uh, and I think the other one's like 10 minutes. Um, but they were a little bit long for this presentation, but again, I'd be happy to send you. Uh, these links because I watched these videos and they were they were pretty pretty good uh, and then I also have some articles uh, that I got a chance to read that I think uh, are really cool um, the first one here the ecological risk assessment of apex predators um, so it's talking about the removal of apex predators not just sharks um, so that was uh, a really cool article it didn't touch only on sharks so I didn't want to make it uh, a big part of the presentation but it does talk about the huge importance of apex predators and their role in whatever ecosystem they're uh, uh, involved with so I thought that was really really cool a lot of really good information in there um, and then we talked about the shark sanctuaries um, and it, it this particular article talks about the positive effects um, of the development of shark sanctuaries in the last 50 years. Um, so it talks about how many have been added in the last 50 years, what's that done for their environment and tourism and, and everything um, in the ecosystem, uh, everything having to do with that particular island or country or whatever it is. Um, some really cool information in there as well. Um, so I've got some, some supplemental to my supplemental material for you guys to look at if you so desired. Um, so that's sort of the end of what I had prepared for you guys. Um, before I start talking about paperwork and certification and all that fun stuff, does anybody have any additional questions for me, comments, concerns, any other fun facts about humans being bioluminescent, Piper? You have any, anything else? I mean, like I said in the very beginning, I learned just as much from you guys as you learned from me. So I, I really appreciate that. Uh, no, I don't have any more fun facts. <laughs> that's all you got? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that's related to that. I've got, like, really random stuff that's completely unrelated, but I don't think you want to know about that. Well, well send here. me an email one time. I'd love to hear all your random fun facts. Don't make me smarter. <laughs> yeah, so over here, we, uh, we enjoyed class. We all enjoyed it. You found some really cool stuff to... To share with us that was pretty cool I, I, that's pretty neat hey I think you should totally email all those links to all of us I, I think I should uh, it has some really good material in there I have a small confession to make I, I've been sort of a big fan of sharks since forever you know how when you're a little kid you're kind of scared of sharks and everybody loves dolphins I was the other way around I was like eh, dolphins yeah they're cool but I thought sharks were super cool yep yep I'm with you Piper 
and my parents thought I was crazy. You know, I, I have uh, this small little book that I got from like a fifth grade book fair. It's called the Sharkopedia. And I still have that book. It, it has some upper level science, you know, material in it, but I read it as like a fifth grader and I will probably keep that book forever. Um, so it was really a pleasure getting to share my uh, geeky finds with you guys today. Um, as far as your paperwork goes, so I have Scott, I have your paperwork. Ian, I have your paperwork. Um, and